We are excited to have a guest here today to talk about uh, sports gambling, sports betting, changes in laws, and changes potentially in the way we conduct ourselves as sports fans. So um, I'm really pleased to have John Lukasik. He is the director of race, sports, and esports for Caesars there in Las Vegas. And uh, certainly I know it's been an interesting time, but I really appreciate you taking the time to join us, John. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Obviously, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart uh, in, in, in many ways. So I appreciate being here. Excellent. Well, yeah, I wanted to start with that notion of times they are changing. Uh, yes. we, we certainly seem to have gotten a bit more permissive with uh, sports gambling. We certainly had recent legislation that opened it up to more states. Um, and so, you know, it really seems to be you know, we're going to have a majority of states here very shortly that have some form of sports betting. How has that changed your role or the role of sports betting within the Las Vegas landscape? Yeah, so uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, one of, one of the misconceptions is that a lot of people come out to Vegas specifically to sports bet. And, you know, while that's true for events such as the Super Bowl, March Madness, um, we definitely get a lot of California traffic. But, uh, but for the most part, you know, sports, is, sports betting is kind of an uh, uh, extra ancillary activity for, for most people. So really, at the end of the day, I think it's actually a good thing. There's a lot of people, and this was one of the big debates, how is, how is this, this new legislation where there's so many more states that can now have sports betting, how's that going to affect Las Vegas? And there's some people that think, oh, Las Vegas is doomed. And there's a lot of other people on the other side of the spectrum that feel, you know, with this becoming more mainstream and, and the average person becoming more educated, it's really a win-win for everybody, including Las Vegas, because now we're having a much more educated consumer come in where there's a significant uh, increased amount of interest in the, in the topic. C- certainly, uh, they might be able to get bet at other venues or on their phones or things like that, but there's no place yes. that they're going to find a wall of 30 TV screens like they'll find at some of the sports folks in Vegas, right? It, it, exactly, 100, 100%. I think that at the end of the day, Las Vegas is still Las Vegas. There was a lot of worry that during the big poker boom, you know, going back almost 20 years ago, that it was going to have the same effect on Las Vegas, but it, all, all it did was it just increased interest. Because sure. like you said, at the end of the day, Obviously, I'm biased, but Las Vegas is still Las Vegas. Well, I, I think when you talk about the concern or the threat, the biggest concern we've always had with sports is that our games or our contests become compromised. Uh, we've had point shaving scandals. We've had Tim Donaghy. How, how prevalent do you think that could happen, and how realistic is it to worry that the outcomes are fixed in some way? Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up. And that obviously is one of, the, one, one of the big issues that we have and one of, the big, one of the big topics, one of the big debates right now. But the question I would pose is, do you feel that by sports betting becoming regulated, more out of the shadows um, in general, so you're having more, more legal, legal bookmaking, you're having more integrity, oversight, more committees that are, look, that are watching out for this, you have third-party independent companies. You have the, 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 these companies that provide the betting lines that are looking for these anomalies and betting patterns. And, you know, we as bookmakers too, we have a responsibility that we have to point out these anomalies, any sort of suspicious activity we bring to the gaming, gaming control board, your gaming commission. So at the end of the day, the, the question I would ask is, I mean, do you feel that it, by it, there being much more oversight and more regulation, that that's going to lead to additional uh, match fixing? Or, you know, is, is that going to cut it back? What I does mean, exist out there? Yeah, I, I mean, the argument has always been that no one's more concerned about match, match fixing than, you know, the, the bet makers. Uh, the people who constantly uh, are trying to make sure they have that, that profit motive built in. And maybe, maybe it's good for you to take our audience through how you make money, the role of the VIG, and what a betting line really means as far as how you generate profit. Sure, so what we do is we offer several sorts of bets that people can make. Uh, So being uh, Alabama, I'll I'll give you some Alabama. Uh, Well, we'll use that as a point of reference. So, So somebody you can bet on, let's say you want to bet on the Crimson Tide to win the national championship. You can just make a simple bet at whatever odds they are to win to win the, the championship. So if they're, let's, let's say they're plus 300, 
that would mean for every hundred dollars you wager on them, if they win, you would actually profit three hundred dollars. You can bet on any individual game as well. So you could have Alabama Auburn. Maybe Alabama is a five point favorite. So you would you would wager, and if Alabama won by more than five points, your bet would win. Now, one of the ways we make money is we do uh, we charge something that's called a vig for short, or vigorish, uh, or juice. Sometimes it's called. And so what we do is we build in a little bit of a house edge or a house advantage uh, for every for every wager that that's placed. And you know, in the long run, you know professional sports bettors, they, they can win. And there are people that, that do. What we do is we, 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 we give a little percentage. So if we take even money on both sides, that we get roughly four and a half, five percent in the long run over an infinite sample size is what we're going for. Uh, and that's how we make money. And then on those bets such as Alabama to win uh, the championship, those have a much higher percentage because of the payout could be significant, especially if you have, you know, one of these teams that might be 100 to one, obviously you don't see it too much in college football, but in some sports, and we, we had that a couple of years ago with the St. Louis Blues um, and the Washington Nationals uh, last year for the World Series, there were some people that made uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars on them. Well, I think that's one of the misconceptions we have is that Vegas decides or tells you who's going to win when really right. lots of times the lines are simply de devised to have equal betting on both sides. Um, so you're trying it's, to, it's more about what the public does with that line than anything else, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's funny. I was just talking about this in, in a seminar recently, uh, you know, the goal of the bookmaker. And you're right. One of the goals is you want to get kind of the even amount of money on both sides. And we have that little bit of the edge, the house advantage, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, it's gotten a little more sophisticated over the previous couple of years. And what we do is a lot of times bookmakers, what they're trying to do is they're actually setting the lines and they're letting the, what we call the sharp betters, the people that are really smart, the people that really know their stuff, the professionals that make the money. And we see where those people are betting. And when they tend to, when, when, a, when a large percentage of them tend to bet one way, we kind of change that line saying, okay, we're being informed by the, by the super intelligent people as to what those odds should be on any one of those games. Yeah, so let's talk internationally here because I think mm. sports sports betting has a different role within American sports compared to some other places. What do we know about the role of sports gambling in other nations and uh, some of these notions of taboo that we're still struggling with here? Right, so it's really interesting. You look at the United Kingdom, for instance. Up until recently, they had 9,000 of these betting shops. So what a betting shop is, it's kind of like your 7-Eleven. You go in, there are these, these small little little corner stores on, on streets, and you would walk in, and there would be one person working behind a counter. There might be a couple TVs up there where you can watch the games. They have the odds displayed, and you go and make bets. So it's very prevalent, very a little bit more in the open. But then also you look at a lot of the, the soccer teams out in, in Europe, and they have sponsorships with a, with a bunch of different industries, and one of them being sports betting. So there's actually a lot of these teams that they'll have a, a, a sports betting website just on their jersey. And some of these sponsorships can, you know, they can go up to up to several hundred thousands of dollars in the second tier leagues. And then when you start getting into the premier leagues, you can be looking at a multi-million dollar sponsorship deal. But I mean, this is something that is front and center with, with a lot of this. Now, having said that, there are a lot of countries, there are some countries that are really kind of looking at this and they're taking this much more seriously. And I believe, I want to say Italy recently banned it or they are banning it. And there are some um, countries that are also kind of restricting it a little bit more because again, I mean, anybody now on TV is getting that advertisement and they're looking at, you know, what that advertisement what impacts that could have on concepts such as minors, responsible gambling, uh, et cetera. Some of those more sociological, uh, sociological issues that, that they do take seriously. Yeah, um, I, I, I think there's always this, this concern about addiction and gambling addiction yeah. and things like that. And uh, I'm curious if you can contrast the average sports better as opposed to the average gambler in Las Vegas. Because for instance, you know, I did work on fantasy sports and uh, I always made the argument, at least with traditional fantasy, I don't know of any degenerate gamblers who draft their team in August hoping to double or triple their money in January when they find out whether they won. Uh, so, so does that distance between when I place a bet and when I find out if it, it, it came through 
For blackjack, it's a matter of seconds. For roulette, it's a matter of seconds. Here, we're still talking about minutes, hours, days, or months. How does that change the equation? I don't even know what I can contribute because you really hit the nail on the head in, okay. my, in my personal opinion. No, but no, uh, in, in all seriousness, that is one of, one of the big topics. And so when you think about problem gambling, responsible gambling, you know, one, one of the things that you, that, that you look for is, you know, th there are several factors, obviously, but a lot of it is that losing yourself in a zone, zoning out. It's just pressing, right? It's just press, 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 spin, 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 spin. And like you said, that the, the time from the bet to the resolution can be less than a second in, in some times, right? Whereas sports betting, you know, you're making that, that wager and then you have to wait for the game to start and you have to wait for the game to conclude. Now let's not say that, okay, you bet a team and they're up 34 to three at halftime. You say, oh, the, the bet's done. But I mean, you're looking for several hours, right? So you're not getting that zoning out. Now, having said that, one of the things that we've seen that's grown in prominence is in-play betting. So it's as the game is going on, now there's new lines that are made for the game. There could be certain propositional wagers, such as will Tom Brady throw for 150 yards in the second, third, and fourth quarter combined. So you have some of those things which have those shorter windows of resolution. So that is one of the topics that's being addressed. But uh, in my personal opinion, you are, you are absolutely uh, spot on there when you talk about that time of resolution. And the, the lengthier the time of resolution, um, I mean, the less of a correlation to problem gambling uh, typically uh, one would have. Yeah, uh, certainly one thing we've heard about, particularly in the NBA, I feel like, is that notion of in-game betting, second-to-second, mm -hmm. -second, possession-to-possession, where you could bet on those things there. How much of that has to do with getting to zero latency for technology? Uh, certainly we found, uh, you know, we have flash boys with the, uh, with the stock market where, you know, they can get in to a desirable number just microseconds before the general public sees that number change. Um, is in-game betting to that degree, uh, moment to moment, possible in the near future? Great question. And that you, you have, again, you hit, you hit the nail on the head, Andy, because uh, you're, you're talking about the latency and the delay. Also the delay in the TV feed. If you're tense, if you're talking about a satellite high definition feed, that could be 10, 15 seconds behind. And now you're talking about making a wager on a discrete event that could theoretically could be, I mean, it, it it, it could be one second, you know, two seconds ahead of when you're placing the wager, but to you, it doesn't look like that. So I think when you look at certain sports, such as baseball, football, where there's those more natural breaks, I think they, they play more to that. However, like you said, basketball in particular, especially the way that the NBA and Adam Silver have really embraced the concept of, of gambling, maybe not the NBA per se, but Adam Silver, the commissioner embraced gambling and he wanted, he wanted to take a progressive stance. And I think that you're seeing a lot more interest in, in, in basketball in, in many ways um, and, you know, for these specific events. But, yeah, I, I think it's going to take some of that, the latency issues, the delay. And then also sometimes people will make those in-play wagers and then they have to wait. There's also a delay between when the bet is approved as well. So really time, time really is the enemy and that is the number one thing that has to get figured out uh, with that. In the near future, in the next few years, I, I think it's a distinct possibility. You know, we're down to final question. We're almost yeah. out of time. But I wanted to back up for a moment, really talk about, to you, what is gambling? Because we always hear it's, it's whenever the chance of, you know, luck versus skill, and whenever luck is the majority of the outcome, uh, that makes it gambling. However, we certainly have all sorts of different varieties of that. You know, there are professional poker players. I don't know of any professional slot machine players because there's just so much luck you can't ever really game that system. Where does sports fit in that continuum? Oh, that's a great question. I think it, uh, on that continuum, I, I feel that sports is, is definitely skill. Uh, there are um, a lot of different skillful components. It's not just, it's not just saying, okay, I know this team's better than, than this team. It's, you know, you look at the best of the best of the best people. I mean, these are people creating prediction models um, with multiple variables and inputs going in and making uh, very specific predictions and outcomes of games. So it's not necessarily, I think this team's better than this team. It's saying, I think this team is 12 and a half points better than this team, right? Not even I think, 
the data suggests this team is 12 and a half points better than this team. So much like you talk about with daily fantasy sports, where there's people that create algorithms um, to really get down to, to the uh, nitty gritty here and understand this stuff on a granular level, that exists as well with sports. However, the majority of people, um, they're going to bet on sports uh, to, to really enhance the viewership experience or to bet on their team because, you know, they, they, they want it's, to, it's a way of extending fanship in a way by showing the faith that you have in your team. There's also something really quickly called the emotional hedge where maybe, again, you're an Alabama fan, so you wager on the other team. That way, either Alabama wins or you win money, even if Alabama loses the game. That so th there's, right, there's, but yes. Right, right. So there are different concepts, but but I think you know for the most part, it really is a way to uh, enhance the, the viewership experience. But I, I would say on that continuum, sports is definitely on the the far end of the skill compared to like you mentioned, particularly slot machines, which are all luck. John, this is great stuff. Thanks so much for giving us your insight. Really appreciate it. All right, appreciate it. All right, thanks for having me.